Hi, I'm Harry McNally. Welcome to McNally's Musket Missive. I'm the titular Harry McNally, and this is the titular musket. Uh, before we begin, let's get into a little bit about who I am and why I'm doing this. I am uh, well, I'm an American Civil War historian and also a reenactor. I have a bachelor's degree in history with a concentration in Civil War studies, and I've just been accepted to a master's program in American uh, history. So it's gotten to the point where doing research has become fun for me. God help me. Uh, what this channel is going to be about is the development of U.S. muskets from uh, the establishment of the National Arsenals at Harper's Ferry in Springfield in 1794 to the end of the Civil War in 1865, the period of the muzzle-loading black powder musket. Uh, there's not a lot about that on YouTube at the moment, so I thought I'd fill that gap, although it's possible that gap exists for a reason. Uh, if I get lots of followers, I'll keep going. If not, this will probably fizzle out. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get into it. So first, what is a musket? Uh, strictly speaking, uh, the simple definition would be a smooth bore, which is no rifling, uh, black powder, muzzle loader, meaning you put the bullet in the end and then you cram it down. Uh, we all know the terms lock, stock, and barrel, so let's go into that a little bit. Uh, what does it mean exactly? So you've got the lock, this mechanism here, that's what actually controls the firing. The trigger actuates a lever inside the lock, uh, this uh, bit called the cock uh, holds a piece of flint which strikes this part, the frizzen or battery, that makes sparks which fall into the pan which holds a small charge of powder, the powder ignites, goes into the vent on the barrel which is the small hole here where the, uh, where the pan meets the barrel. Uh, inside the barrel you've got your charge of powder up, uh, behind your, uh, your projectile so once the pan ignites that ignites the hopefully ignites the main charge in the barrel and the expanding gases push the, the, the projectile out of the barrel and towards whatever it is you're shooting at. And then the stock is the wooden part that holds all of that together. So lock, stock, and barrel are the three major components of a musket. And now that we've gotten the basics out of the way, I can get into the preliminary background history that I need to talk about before getting to this specific musket. At the end of the American Revolution, uh, we had large stockpiles left behind of both British and French muskets left over from the war, and also a number left behind after the end of the Seven Years' War. Uh, basically, these, two, these muskets break down into two different patterns, uh, the French-style Charleville pattern and the British Brown Best style. Muskets following the French Charleville pattern retained the barrel against the stock by the use of a barrel band. This would be a loop of metal that went around the barrel and the stock to hold the barrel in, in, in place. A full-size musket would have three, the front one being larger than the other two and also having a brass front sight. Muskets following the British Brown Best pattern used a much more complicated key and lug system to retain the, the barrel to the stock. Uh, this would require both a slot cut into the side of the stock to allow the key to slide all the way through, but also a cut into the inside of the stock allowing the lug to fit inside as well. Additionally, both the key... Now, I'm not... At Entirely sure at what point it began doing this, but in addition, the key would have a slot cut down the middle of it as well, and that would be mated with a little notch inside of the, uh, the log, so that a private in the field taking apart his musket couldn't pull the key all the way out of the weapon and lose it, thus rendering his weapon useless. As we moved into the 1790s, the needs of the national government were not being met just by the stockpiles of refurbished arms we had left over from these previous wars. And so on April 2nd, 1794, Congress authorized the establishment of national arsenals to manufacture, locally, new arms. Uh, they, they authorized the mul uh, several, but in the end, only two were established under this act. Uh, the one in Springfield, Massachusetts, and the one in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, later West Virginia. Now, a brief word, the word arsenal and armory are often used interchangeably to describe these facilities, although the words themselves have different meanings. An arsenal is traditionally a place where arms are made, and an armory is a place where they're stored. Since these facilities serve both purposes, the terms were often used interchangeably. Congress also authorized a number of contracts for arms production and also the purchase of arms from overseas to meet the immediate needs while the national arsenals were established and built. Uh, the facility at Springfield already existed but was used for the uh, storage and refurbishment of existing arms and refurbishment is different 
from manufacturing. So new tooling, new, new personnel had to be brought in, and the facility at Harpers Ferry hadn't even begun to be, hadn't even been built yet. Uh, by 1800, both facilities were producing s some number of arms, and uh, fairly early on, Harpers Ferry developed a reputation for quality. In 1806, Secretary of War Henry Dearborn stated in a report, Although the muskets manufactured at the Springfield Armory are not as highly finished as those made at Harpers Ferry, they are still considered equal, if not superior, in workmanship to the best muskets manufactured for the use of soldiers in either France or England. The differences between muskets made at Springfield and Harpers Ferry go beyond quality as well. Uh, there were technical differences. They were making the same musket in a large sense, but in, in detail they were making two separate models. Uh, standardization wouldn't really come until the model 1816, which began production in Harpers Ferry in 1819, and I think in 1818 for Springfield. Um, until then, both would just make their own little revisions to model. They'd, there, there'd be cross-correspondence. What would work at one place would be adopted by another, and vice versa. But for the most part, they were pretty much working separately until they started really hammering down, hey, maybe we should decide whether or not the bayonet lug goes on top or on bottom of the barrel. That was actually a fairly common uh, difference, not only between Harpers Ferry and Springfield muskets, but also Springfield muskets and Springfield muskets and Harpers Ferry and Harpers Ferry muskets, I think. What I have here today is a Harpers Ferry model. Bah, bah, bah. What I have here today is a Harpers Ferry Charleville pattern type one musket. Um, the Charleville pattern is often referred to by collectors as the Model 1795, but model year designations didn't come about until 1816, so it's just a collector's term of art. Uh, this one was made in 1808 and is among the last of the Type 1s, uh, Type 2 production phasing in sometime around 1808 to 1809. Uh, so let's get it over to the light box and take a look. So as a general overview, this musket is about 5 feet long. Uh, nominally, these muskets would have a 44 inch barrel, but uh, that, that would vary depending on the specific musket. As I said before, these were not machine finished, these were very much handmade weapons. Uh, as this is a Charleville pattern musket, uh, you can see that uh, the barrel is held in place with barrel bands. Uh, and as this is a full length musket, there are three of them. The lock plate is dated 1808, and as you can see, it was made at Harpers Ferry. Uh, this particular example was a reconversion back to flint. Uh, most muskets were converted to percussion sometime in the 1840s, 1850s. As a result of that, I would say that most of these parts that you see, the, uh, the frizzen, the pan, the, the frizzen spring, the cock, all of this is suspect in terms of uh, being original. I don't they, they very well could be original parts uh, put on, to, uh, put on uh, during the restoration process. Uh, I'm not an expert on this, so I really can't say one way or another. Uh, here we have Harper's Ferry's uh, proof markings, uh, the V, uh, the P with the eagle head, and then the U.S. property mark. Harper's Ferry's barrel markings differed from those of Springfield, so I can defini definitively state that this barrel was made at Harper's Ferry. Uh, next, we're looking at the barrel bands. Uh, as you can see, uh, the left side of the photo is towards the butt, and the right side of this towards the muzzle. So as you can see, these, uh, these band springs also have a post and hole configuration to retain them in place. Uh, this would be a change that they make towards the end of uh, the Charleville pattern production, moving the barrel band retention springs to the front of the bands, because that's a lot less labor intensive. You don't have to measure and uh, accurately line things up for the post and hole configuration. Uh, the primary, uh, the exception to that rather, being the uh, front barrel band since uh, there's no, there's no stock in front of it to put a, to put a band spring there, so the post and hole configuration would remain until uh, the end of the use of Charleville derivatives, uh, beginning with the production of the Model 1855. And, and here we see, as I previously mentioned, the brass front sight that is brazed onto the front barrel band, uh, which differs this from the British Brown Bess, which did not have a front sight and generally used the, uh, the bayonet lug as a, as a front sight. 
Harpers Ferry would continue producing uh, Charlevoix pattern muskets until 1819, when they transitioned over to the uh, Model 1816. But that's a story for another day. I hope you enjoyed this first episode of McNally's Musket Missive. If you did, please consider sh subscribing to my channel. Please do hit like, and maybe leave a comment below. Uh, all this engagement drives uh, the algorithm to show this video to more people, and the bigger the audience I can get, the better. Uh, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Bye.